Welcome back to The Daily Poem here on the Close Reads Podcast Network. I'm David Kern. Before I get to today's poem, which is by Mary Oliver, I wanted to let you know that we are going to add a little bit of an extension to our poetry memorization contest. So we had said the 15th, but we're going to say the 17th. So today is Monday, June 10th, and we'll make it Monday, June 17th when submissions have to be. And that gives everyone the weekend. Just seemed, uh, seemed like, you know, maybe some kids could use uh, the extra weekend to, to memorize and then get their recitations up. So again, extension for our poetry memorization contest for this summer is to have your poem and your recitation posted by Monday, June 17th. And remember the hashtag for that is hashtag TDP contest. All right, you've heard from Mary Oliver many times on this podcast. She passed away earlier this spring, earlier this year. And the poem that I'm going to read today is called Summer Poem. Seems appropriate. Leaving the house, I went out to see the frog, for example, in her shining green skin, and her eggs like a slippery veil, and her eyes with their golden rims, and the pond with its risen lilies, and its warmed shores dotted with pink flowers, and the long, windless afternoon, and the white heron, like a dropped cloud, taking one slow step, then standing a while, then taking another, writing her own soft-footed poem through the still waters. Summer poem is made up of 13 two-line stanzas. And the two-line stanza is something I'm kind of interested in and kind of fascinated by. In his book, A Little Book on Form, an exploration to the formal imagination of poetry, Robert Haas, who won the Pulitzer Prize for his own poetry, has a whole chapter on the two-line stanzas and, and on two-line poems. And he has a paragraph at the beginning of that chapter that goes like this. The first question is what formal devices give a pair of lines to There are two basic formal devices in English poetry. The first is oral, rhyme. The second is visual, stanza patterning. The two lines can share the same meter or grammatical structure, or they can make a logical or grammatical unit, or share some other element, first word, last word, and so on. The usual term for a pair of lines joined by some device is a couplet, in Greek, a distich. And so I was thinking about this because this is one of those poems that the, the 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 stanzas the lines don't they don't rhyme and so that would give the second uh, device that Haas mentions uh, visual stanza patterning. And I was thinking about why Mary Oliver may have chosen uh, to to write this as two line poems, and I didn't necessarily come to a conclusion. But later in the same chapter, Robert Haas writes about the English couplet, which was something that Chaucer used regularly. And he says that you have to make a distinction between closed couplets, which make a completed statement. So at the end of the couplet, the idea is completed. And open couplets, which are enjammed, and, and the couplets run into each other, and you have to read all the different couplets together, or at least multiple couplet, couplets together, to get a complete thought. And he writes this, In the Renaissance, the form is everywhere. Trimeter, tetrameter, pentameter, couplets, open and closed. And in the 17th century, there is a kind of war between the closed pentameter couplet, completing its sense every two lines, and the open one, which doesn't. George Sainsbury, the great late Victorian scholar of prosody, describes the poets of the open couplet as thinking, quote, no more of the end of the line than if they were writing prose, except that it is a place where you have to provide a rhyme, end quote. This practice, he says, quote, supplies a sort of obligato accompaniment to the rhythm, a sort of low guitarish accompaniment of rhyme music, end quote. In the 18th century, of course, the closed pentameter couplet, the heroic couplet, came to be the form of choice. And that's, that was just uh, Robert Haas there, with a little bit of help from George Sainsbury. So, on the one hand, we have this, perhaps this visual uh, structure, this visual poetry that Mary Oliver is after. And I wish I, frankly, I wish I could figure out why she chose two lines here visually, if there is something visual about it. <clears throat> I was thinking about probably the idea that in the, the, the things that she mentions, the images that she mentions in these couplets 
perhaps might be dancing with one another. That, that's the image that we're supposed to get. So each line kind of represents uh, a partner. So you have two partners dancing with one another. Um, the frog, her green skin, the eggs, the veil, the eyes, the golden rims, the pond, the lilies, the warm shores, the pink flowers, the windless afternoon, the white heron, the dropped cloud, the slow step, the standing a while, the writing, the soft-footed poem through the still waters. And so each of these things become like partners with one another that are dancing. So in a sense, it's true. These, these are open couplets where the ideas are um, in jammed together. You have to read multiple couplets, multiple stanzas to get the complete thought. But on the other hand, in the images, each of these couplets does contain a whole idea because of the relationships between the two things. Even if the, the, the lines themselves don't create a sentence or a complete thought, the fact that these images have been pushed together, shall we say, or have been um, made to dance together, that is a complete thought in and of itself. Those pairings, the pairing itself is, is a thought of its own. Um, so, so I suspect that's what she's going after there. And I think it's pretty effective. So, once more, here is Mary Oliver's summer poem. Leaving the house, I went out to see the frog, for example, in her shining green skin, and her eggs like a slippery veil, and her eyes with their golden rims, and the pond with its risen lilies, and its warmed shores dotted with pink flowers, and the long windless afternoon, and the white here and like a dropped cloud, taking one slow step, then standing a while, then taking another, writing her own soft-footed poem through the still waters. This has been The Daily Poem. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back tomorrow with another poem for you.